I am truly fascinated about how cannabis is developing around the different regions of the world, country to country. And this channel is certainly going to take a focus on digging into those specific countries with representatives in those areas. Today, however, we're going to take a look at the Northern Hemisphere, specifically the United States, Canada, the UK, Germany, Switzerland and Israel from a South African perspective with my guest for the interview, Sibu Cecil Zaba. I hope you enjoy it. So today I've got Sibisi Suzaba, or Sibs as I commonly uh, refer to him, uh, from Africa Cannabis Advisory on with us today. And today we're going to do something different. I know, Sibs, that you've spoken heavily about the African market. And uh, today we're going to really talk about some more of the Northern Hemisphere markets. But before we get into that, um, I'd like to find out, so, you know, how did you get into your touch point with cannabis and into this market? Because you have a bit of a financial background. So what drew you into uh, what we call this cannabis industry? Sure. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's uh, really great to be uh, on today. Um, I look forward to uh, a really robust and, uh, and, and, uh, and great discussion, just uh, taking a look at the, the international cannabis uh, industry and developments uh, across, uh, across the board. Um, so um, from my perspective, I, uh, um, I started my career in investment banking. Um, I, um, I studied at UCT and got an opportunity to move uh, to London after graduating. Uh, and I worked in the investment banking industry for about uh, eight years. Um, fortunately, I was quite focused on Africa and African transactions and um, you know, working with African governments and corporates uh, and, uh, and other stakeholders. Uh, providing financial solutions and helping finance all kinds of interesting uh, uh, projects. Um, I got into the cannabis industry, um, you know, in a, in a really unexpected way. I think I had always um, been looking for entrepreneurial opportunities um, on the ground. Um, and I, uh, I, uh, I had a colleague who's, uh, whose husband was the founder of one of the, uh, the largest African cannabis uh, um, uh, companies. And, uh, and through engagements with her uh, and, and also uh, some research that I, I had been doing in the agri space um, and, and some networking I had been doing, um, it became apparent that there was something in cannabis. And, and um, as someone who's not naturally uh, sort of, you know, one, one of those individuals who've always sort of been an advocate and an activist, um, it took a, quite a lot of research. Uh, and then a trip to Canatech in Israel uh, in 2019 uh, to really uh, get me to a point where I realized how enormous this opportunity was and how important it, it, it is for Africa to, to get it right um, in terms of job creation, um, positive uh, impact on healthcare and, and medical uh, fields, uh, industrial fields. And, uh, and so I took the leap after, after a couple of months of, uh, of researching and networking. No, awesome. hundred percent. I mean, I'm glad you went to Israel, got the experience. I mean, we're going to probably touch on Israel today. But before we discuss uh, some of the European centers, though Israel is just outside of that, uh, we, let's start with the North American market. I mean, we do know that more than half of Americans live in states that uh, allow for some form of access, mostly recreational in those states. So half have access to recreational, most have access to medical. It's still federally illegal in the States. Um, we've been waiting for the new administration to make a move. Uh, there will probably be some moves on the cards in the future. For now, there will be some degree of speculation. But let's talk a bit about North America and then we can loop that around to maybe Canada after that. Sure. So um, I think with uh, with North America, um, we, we know we have Canada and Canada has really obviously been the, the economy that has globalized cannabis in many ways. Um, most of the capital that's been, ra been raised in the cannabis uh, industry, at least in the first phase of, uh, of sort of global, global cannabis, was uh, from uh, Canadian licensed producers, um, which also play a very significant role in exporting cannabis uh, to, to, to all corners of the, of the globe. Um, but I think everyone is looking at the USA as the sort of um, as the as the, as the big driver of growth in in cannabis, um, and so I think last year, uh, 2020 was an interesting year because um, cannabis stocks, cannabis sales uh, uh, skyrocketed in the US. We had a 50% uh, growth in uh, in the industry, um, uh, reaching about 20 billion dollars. Um, that growth slowed down slightly in 2021, but still very positive momentum. Um, 
But interestingly enough, the equity markets, when you look at cannabis, uh, have declined very significantly from sort of the peaks uh, towards the end of, uh, of 2020. And I think a big reason for that has been the fact that um, a lot of um, uh, stakeholders had anticipated the Democrats to really be proactive when it came to um, moving uh, legislation forward in terms of federal uh, legality of cannabis. And the Democrats have, have obviously have, have had a very difficult time uh, in terms of delivering on the, uh, the core sort of um, policies. And so I think cannabis has taken a bit of a backseat. Uh, and so as a result of, um, I think, some disappointment in expectations of what the Democrats are, uh, will deliver in the way of cannabis, um, as well as some challenges that uh, I think have, have been well uh, broadcast, including extremely um, high operating costs, uh, extremely high tax rates, uh, in certain jurisdictions um, have meant that quite a number of cannabis operators in, in the US have actually struggled to get, uh, you know, to actually scale and, and grow. Um, and so we're seeing an interesting disconnect where certain MSOs or multi-state operators are performing well, um, you know, quarter and quarter, very strong growth, patients, number growth and, and so forth. Um, but a significant percentage of the industry is, is, is struggling and those companies are sort of dragging down the performance uh, of, of the industry. So I think the, um, the midterms are in November this year. Uh, and we don't expect uh, the, uh, the the Democrats to move in terms of um, federal uh, uh, legalization of, of cannabis or in, in some shape or form. And so, and the Democrats are, Republic, are expected to lose the Senate and the House. Um, so that makes it even more difficult in terms of the second half uh, or the second half of Biden's term. So um, a mixed bag, but the um, we are see, we are definitely seeing um, very compelling industry growth uh, in uh, in the US. No, absolutely. I mean, I saw a Vice documentary the other day. Uh, it must have been a few weeks ago, where they were spotlighting the uh, dis or disconnection in the Californian market. Uh, and I mean, realistic estimates even place the illicit Californian market at ten billion, uh, which was a staggering number considering. Uh, the market was doing around 20 billion uh, legally uh, taxable. So the US has a lot of potential. It is a massive consumer driven market. Adult use will eventually uh, cover, I anticipate, most of the jurisdiction. Um, in regards to that, I mean, let's shift maybe to Canada a bit. Um, Canada, obviously, very early to the game, heavily involved. I see there's a lot of movement in terms of the psychedelic approvals uh, landscape. Uh, Health Canada, we know that. Health Canada has been somewhat restrictive in terms of imports into the region. Um, so that's been well documented by NJ Biz in the past. I think going back to September 2020. Um, so any anyone looking to export to Canada has got a lot of work ahead of them for that because you won't uh, get it done easily. Um, and also they're sitting on a billion grams of, uh, of cannabis. Uh, that's inventory that needs to move into markets. And we do see the European markets becoming more selective. Um, but let's now talk about the psych psychedelic. What, what excites you about that psychedelic movement? Uh, obviously, a lot of the pioneers on cannabis have set the pace for that. But it's good to see that uh, there is progress uh, from Health Canada in that front. Definitely. I think um, the, the psychedelic space is, is certainly uh, an area that we watch closely. Um, the, um, the, the main uh, sort of uh, um, selling point, if you will, of psychedelics or, or why it has such a, a strong fo focus is because of its uh, numerous uh, broad uh, applications and, and uh, related to mental health, related to, for example, chronic depression, uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Um, and, you know, we've, we've, we have a situation where um, we do have a global mental health crisis and I think that's undeniable I think COVID has definitely amplified it and and, and um, you know whether it's economic or uh, uh, social um, uh, uh, challenges um, there hasn't been a need for a solution that is sustainable as as what we have uh, today and psychedelics really lends itself well to a lot of these um, uh, sort of challenge mental health challenges um, and so we are still you know relatively early in the psychedelics game they are a number of um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and companies that are really throwing incredible capital behind 
um, the research and, uh, of, of these uh, compounds and, and mapping them to particular conditions and, and forming protocols and so forth. Um, and so it's an area that uh, we, we uh, are watching very closely. We're excited about Canada, I think, is, is, is playing a very important role in terms of uh, you know, sort of taking early steps and, 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 and forming a conducive environment by which uh, in which the sector can can actually uh, get onto its feet and, and and really realize its potential. Exciting space to to watch. No, fully. Uh, I mean, the thing that's also interesting is I saw maps, uh, the multi association uh, or multi disciplinary association for psychedelic studies had a breakthrough in the UK recently as well with um, getting some approvals uh, on that front. So I think let's jump to the UK uh, for discussion. Um, the UK naturally is quite interesting. I mean, you, you've studied in the UK, you have some uh, relationship back to that. I mean, we know the market there is obviously specialist driven. So, you know, about a quarter mm. of the UK can prescribe. I know patient counts, uh, if they have not hit a 10,000 mark, they're very closely approaching that. However, when it comes to the NHS, only I think three or uh, only a handful of patients have actually gotten coverage. So mostly from the private space. Uh, and we've also seen the move of novel foods and dossiers uh, so could you tell me about your view on the UK, how, how it's kind of approaching cannabis and its integration? Sure. So the UK is, is an interesting one because um, if, you, if we sort of travel back to the beginning of uh, 2019 when the UK legalized um, uh, or at least set up a framework for approvals for medical cannabis or legalized medical cannabis, um, I think with, um, in a three to six month uh, span, we had something like 12 approved patients. Um, you know, so, you know, it, it, uh, the head, it, it was a headline grab of everyone getting excited about the UK opening up the, the cannabis uh, industry. Um, but it, it became pretty clear that the political will in terms of making uh, cannabis accessible uh, to, um, to patients in, in a, in a cost effective manner um, wasn't really there. And so that legalization was almost a response to, you know, the many stories we, we know of uh, uh, of of, uh, of cases of, of of kids with epilepsy who were not able to to access cannabis legally, and so they had to create a workaround in order to appease the the sort of social um, uh, and re, uh, the so, social um, pressure. But I think since then, it it has been an extremely uh, uh, exciting market. Uh, to your point, from from sort of uh, 2019 to to now, we're almost nearing 10,000 uh, patients in uh, in the UK. Um, I think the Conservative Party is still not on board. That that's that's something that um, I think we have to keep and keep in mind. You know, um, Boris, um, despite all these other issues, uh, a couple of months back was talking about the need to to really you know almost double down on the war on drugs, um, and uh, and the rhetoric is is, is very much uh, non conducive towards cannabis. But I think we had the mayor of London who uh, is looking now to actually take proactive steps. Uh, to sort of liberalize the, the cannabis ex, uh, um, economy a lot more. Um, so I do think that as even with all these headwinds, we've seen very, very encouraging developments in the UK industry. And um, I, um, we'll see where the political winds blow, but I do suspect that under different uh, either political leader or administration, um, we could actually see a lot of these headwinds uh, turn into uh, tailwinds. Um, interestingly enough, you know, uh, something that a lot of people uh, don't really know about the UK is the fact that uh, by value, the UK is actually one of the largest exporters of, of cannabis globally. Um, and that is GW Pharma. Uh, you know, they've got a massive uh, facility, um, a couple of, of um, I think a couple of hectares even, um, that they use to formulate uh, their registered drugs. Um, and uh, um, funnily enough, um, Theresa May's husband is actually involved in that company, you know, just to kind of piece, you know, uh, uh, some of the, these uh, um, these touch points together, um, and so there is capability in the UK. There is political interest. Obviously, GW um, did have that massive acquisition of uh, I think around seven point two billion uh, by Jazz Pharmaceutical, yeah. um, sort of really signalling uh, you know that uh, the UK has the ability uh, to 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 build compelling cannabis uh, businesses products. Um, the R and D is there. Um, and the potential for this market is certainly there. Um, and that, I think that's also demonstrated in the size of the illicit market. I think uh, the, the consumption is uh, is compelling and one of the highest uh, rates uh, actually in the world. Yeah, no, to the UK, I mean, it's interesting because we mentioned uh, GW, uh, Epidiolex and Sativex products uh, are really it. 
Um, and this is a unique case because here we have a product with some supporting uh, work around a dossier, uh, what would be known as a, a drug master file, uh, essentially having a marketing authorization, getting that reviewed by a traditional regulatory approval process to then use that with some, some clinical support. For the rest of the world, most of the cannabis that is being used is as an unregistered uh, product uh, or in certain jurisdictions, a magistral preparation. Uh, and, and I mean, we can talk about those formats, but I don't know if we we'll the time today. But absolutely, the UK has strong potential. The thing that I found also very interesting is their approach towards CBD products, uh, specifically around getting a dossier, uh, novel food classification. Um, and this is something we don't see in the US. Uh, US, uh, you can get CBD anywhere in any form. Um, there is some quality control naturally, but it's not as extensive as having to put together a dossier and getting approval. And in a way, it's good because it standardizes the products. In a way, it's detrimental to entrepreneurial spirit. But I think when we're dealing with consumer products, uh, there's got to be some kind of standards that come into alignment there. So I think from there, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to jump us over to a discussion with Israel. So so, Sibs, regarding Israel, I think let's talk about the market there because it's one of those countries where I've heard this mentioned many times where actually illicit cannabis is more expensive than legal cannabis. Uh, let's unpack how the market looks in Israel. It's obviously very attractive from patient numbers. It's also the largest importer of cannabis outside of, you know, what we'd consider operations in the States. Uh, so I'll let you take it away. Yeah, I think uh, Israel is, uh, is definitely uh, central in terms of uh, the current state of global cannabis. I think even historically uh, in the way of research, um, you know, with uh, the discovery of uh, cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system, that all came out of Israel. But I think when you look at the sort of legal industry, um, Israel has certainly been punching above its weight. Um, so um, in Israel, I think we've got something around 120, 130,000 uh, patients. Um, and um, as you mentioned, Israel was actually... Uh, I think the the largest importer of cannabis in uh, 2021, and this is despite um, a, a period of I think almost six or seven months where uh, the uh, Israeli regulator um, basically increased the the, the testing requirements uh, or the scope of the testing requirements for flower uh, medical cannabis flower to be imported into Israel, um, and that really caused a, a you know a lot of challenges uh, for for exporters, including exporters from South Africa and, and Lesotho. Um, with, uh, you know, I think only one or two labs known to be able to test for, for these compounds. Uh, so in a way, really restricting the, the, the import volumes. Uh, but that sort of um, worked uh, its way back in, in sort of middle of last year. And we saw about, I think, 22 tons of cannabis being uh, imported into Israel. And I think uh, the consumption estimate is around 40, uh, 40 uh, for, to 45 uh, tons, uh, which is um, incredibly, you know, pretty significant, considering that I think uh, Germany imported uh, just over 10 tons. Uh, and that's been the market that everyone's been focused on and excited about. Um, and I think we also have, you know, a situation where um, Israeli cannabis companies are very uh, you know, um, globally, um, uh, you know, um, focused, you know, there's Together Pharma in, in, in Uganda, which is doing a, a really good job in terms of, uh, you know, sort of um, creating and, and building the cannabis industry there. Uh, a number of other cannabis players in, in, uh, in the likes of Australia and other parts of Africa uh, and so forth. So it's, an, a, it's a really exciting market. Um, I think, um, you know the stat is something like uh, something like twenty over twenty percent uh, of, of of adults consuming cannabis uh, in in Israel. So one of the highest consumption rates per capita, and uh, and still growing. So um, it is uh, it's 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 only a market to to really understand and pack from anyone looking to export or find partners in terms of research or uh, processing or. Um, uh, or, or sort of global linkages. I think Israel's done a fantastic job over the last uh, couple of, of years. No, I fully agreed. I mean, I know they've got a, a strong focus on the control union, uh, cannabis medical standards. Um, I know that it was 295 pesticides that actually need to go through that testing, uh, which does probably mean you're going to have to have a GCMS, uh, a gas chromatography mass spectrometer, as well as the HPLC coupled to a mass spec as well. Uh, so definitely a challenge in terms of those imports. And it was quiet. Uh, for those first six months of last year. But it seems like the variety customers have access to has improved. I do know there's talk about an additional 16 pesticides being tested from May of this year onwards. 
So we'll see how that develops. But absolutely, the, based on the patient number, a market worth discussing, based on the research they've done, also from a clinical perspective, an important market. I think from that, let's jump to the next biggest market in that area, which is if we go back into mainline, uh, mainline Europe, uh, Germany. I know I had a recent discussion on Germany. Uh, it's an interesting one. I mean, there's the 16 federal states. Bavaria is treated a little differently in terms of how they prescribe. Um, you know, it's a bit unique because you can only really have basically one owner to four dispensaries. So you've got a, a strong reliance on wholesalers bringing the market together. Uh, there's the magistral formulation side. How do you see the German market developing? There's the talk about adult use in the future with the new party. Uh, there was a big news sensation last year. Where are our views on Germany? So I think the German market has been sort of the um, main, you know, sort of focal market for, for the international uh, cannabis uh, community. I think the fact that, you know, over sort of a three, uh, four year period, we've gone from uh, in 2017 to zero to um, uh, to, to over 100 and, 110,000 patients uh, is, demonstrates the growth potential of, of, of Germany. But I think one of the most interesting um, uh, components of the German industry is the fact that uh, medical insurance quite often covers the cost of um, of patients looking to uh, to buy cannabis, and I think the percentage is around sixty percent of those medical uh, insurance uh, submissions are, are, are approved, um, which obviously supports uh, the the growth and and uh, and the uh, expansion of uh, of the patient uh, market in Germany. I think we. Um, we have seen a slight uh, decline in the rate of growth. Um, I think if you compare the first uh, sort of um, three quarters of 2021 versus the first three quarters of 2020, it's around a 7% uh, growth that's been achieved according to the Prohibition Partners, which is um, which is a little bit of a disappointment. I think they um, they are certain uh, you know sort of structural challenges. Um, with uh, with sort of the anticipated growth of the German market, you know, sort of um, I think physician uh, uh, sort of education and, and sort of acceptance of cannabis is still something that's been worked on, um, and so I think this will be an interesting year to sort of monitor um, how uh, you know the German market evolves. But you know, pretty much every global licensed producer that's exporting is looking to export to Germany, is looking to meet German EU GMP standards and get approval, uh, because that's basically seen as the global goal, goal standards. Once you have that, um, as other markets uh, sort of open up, you've got the ability to pretty much move product into those markets because you pretty much uh, uh, managed to get the the, the gold standard. Um, and so um, it's it's one that continues to be a, a, at the heart and center in the way of, of focus. But as we both know, getting that that uh, EU GMP is is quite a, a mammoth task, um, extremely uh, expensive and, and time consuming, and uh, and and it is something that um, you know um, it does make it quite difficult to to enter that uh, that that market. But you know, for the players that are able to get uh, across the line, uh, it certainly, um, you know, uh, is a compelling uh, a market and entry point into into sort of the rest of Europe and even other pockets uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, of, uh, of legal markets in, uh, across the globe. Yeah, no, sure. 100%. I mean, the EU GMP, you need to realize you're in a pharmaceutical business uh, when you're at that level, uh, you, you know, as much as and there's often a lack of um, not that it's it's relative, you know, but I do think for quality control, you're going to need to partner up with strong pharmaceutical existing businesses to understand that GMP framework to move into those markets uh, as long as it's being treated medicinally. There's the interest, obviously, of what will happen. Uh, we don't want to get to look into any kind of crystal balls, but, uh, you know, developments will probably take about 18 months to two years for adult use. Um, there's some interesting pilot programs in the Netherlands and elsewhere around uh, adult use, Switzerland as well. Um, which brings me maybe to the point of let's touch on Switzerland. Switzerland's interesting because of the 1% THC uh, description there. Uh, essentially, above that, it's a narcotic. Below that, it's it's fair game. And the thing we have seen in the Swiss market is the, the 1%, uh, the, a lot of CBD flour. Um, it has resulted in products being washed to bring your THC levels into compliance, uh, which is maybe not the right way to go about it. But um, Swiss market is interesting because of that CBD flower. And we saw the French also recently had a ruling around allowance for certain uh, sale of CBD flower. I know there's a contestation in Ireland 
around CBD as well and products being sold to bring it in alignment with European standards. And that's even at the 0.2% while now moving to the 0.3%. Uh, so let's talk about the Swiss market. Uh, what makes it unique? I mean, obviously, sale of flour, uh, CBD flour is a unique selling point or discussion point. How do you see the Swiss market? Yeah, I think um, Switzerland has, has certainly been uh, one of those must you know, watch uh, markets within uh, within Europe. Um, the one percent uh, limit in Switzerland has, has very much broken the mold in, in sort of the rest of Europe, um, and that's really um, allowed for a lot more uh, you know sort of commercial activity, um, a lot more uh, sort of product variability um, and flexibility with producers, and I think that's something that. Uh, you know, has, has been a huge challenge uh, for for the industry. So, um, you know, the Swiss uh, uh, the Swiss uh, the Swiss market is uh, and, and and Switzerland is proving to uh, to really um, want to position itself as uh, a, a leader in, in the cannabis industry within within Europe. Uh, I think the um, trial, uh, the recreational cannabis trial, is obviously. Um, one that is, uh, you know, extremely interesting. We all watching that very, very carefully, um, but it sort of lays the groundwork for uh, uh, for expansion beyond medical uh, uh, cannabis into uh, into into adult use. Um, and uh, there are a number of, of trials you mentioned the Netherlands as well, but I think because of the progress that's uh, the progressive uh, um, sort of slant that Switzerland has, um, it, it certainly is uh, a market that we feel. Uh, will will continue to will will continue to actually have a, whole, a very strong uh, position in the European cannabis industry as as it expands. No, fully, fully. I think what we'll do is we're going to call it there today because there's a lot more to talk about in Europe. I mean, there's obviously Portugal, there, there's Spain, there's the aspects yeah. around Malta uh, and their focus on the market. There's Poland, the Czech Republic, really pushing. France has got its own uh, issues to deal with. Uh, hemp being a big talking point in France because it was never actually made legal hemp in the region, which means from a genetic standpoint, the French market's interesting. Ireland has got some interesting things to be spoken about as well. There's a lot, and I'm mm -hmm. skipping over them. There's Greece as well. So th th there's definitely yeah. a lot to talk about that. I think we're going to come back on for another discussion around the rest of Europe. What I'd like to also touch on is we we're focusing maybe a bit initially on the Northern Hemisphere, but we're going to also then jump into the Latin American markets Interesting ones like Uruguay, yeah. Brazil, Colombia, uh, Mexico. Uh, there's a lot to be said. Australia, New Zealand, still in the development stages of really catching up to what is Australia's at. But Australia by itself is probably a solid discussion. So that and the rest of Africa. So Serbs, I'm going to say thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on so we can talk about Canada, North America briefly, as well as uh, that pocket of Israel, Germany and Switzerland. And I'm looking forward to our next engagement and discussion. And be sure to uh, follow us for the next one. Thanks, Serbs. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chef. It's been great. Look forward to the next one. Absolutely.